Namaste and welcome to Nepal Conversations. Nepal Conversations is a podcast series where we talk to scholars and researchers about the interesting work on various aspects of Nepali society. This series is presented jointly by International Research Project Heritage as Placemaking and Nepal Conversations. Hello everybody. Today we have Bryony Whitmarsh who is professor of Heritage and Museum Studies at the University of Southampton. She's also associate dean um international at Southampton. Bryony has had a long career in museums and then she did a PhD at SOAS um after which she worked for the University of Portsmouth for a while. For her PhD she looked at Narayan Hiti Palace Welcome to Nepal Conversations Bryony it's it's really wonderful to have you in this podcast series we understand that you you've done your research on Narayan Hiti Palace and you approached it from heritage studies and anthropological points of view um this was of course after the palace had ceased to be residence for the kings of nepal um so this was quite uh, timely and topical at that point of time but could you tell us a little bit more about how did you get interested on this issue how did you come about conducting your phd research on narayan palace thanks uma so when i was 21 and um i lived and volunteered in nepal in an eastern and um district of nepal in a small village called makaibari near to charikot and um i was living with friends and working and um with people in the village for a period of about 9 months i then came back to the uk had a career working in museums and um for around 10 years so was very used to using museums as a space to think with and then when i finally saved up the money and um to go back to nepal i really wanted to understand what had happened and um and um in the intervening period so this was in 2010 and i left in 1998 and um so you've got 12 years in between in which a lot took place and all of my friends from 1998 had left the country and i particularly wanted to understand kind of you know what had happened in their lives that caused this um these big moves and um so i was visiting and um as a tourist and um and with my husband we decided to go and visit the narayan hiti palace museum and i thought that this was going to be the perfect place as this previous center of power and um for the country to help me to understand these different political changes that had happened and i went around the museums and a museum and i found i came out with many many more questions than i had answers and the research project began to build from there that's really interesting so what exactly are the differences between the palace as a working representative palace of a monarchy and a museum of the former palace in the federal Dem- democratic republic of nepal so this is probably going to be a little bit of a, a long answer so feel free to interject at any point but you have the narayan hiti palace that came to be the administrative center of the shah monarchy in 1951 at that time it was one of three different palaces and um that each had distinct and separate roles to play in um upholding the shah dynasty and um so this was the administrative center not the religious center and um of the monarchy and its modern origins a trace back to the spatial politics of the rana regime and then um, which was the semi colonial regime and um that um during the 19th century from um 1847 to 1951 and the rana regime and um moved and um the shah monarch of the time and um to live inside the bounds and um of narayan hiti palace and all of the rana palaces and um and um were um small citadels if you like designed to create separation between the people outside and the pe- people inside so between the rulers inside and the people who were being ruled outside and it was the case with the these walls that they were intended to keep people both in and out so in this case you have the king designed to be kept in 
And the reason that this is important is because, of course, these walls still persist today and are still an important part of the way that people and, um, experience the palace compound. So even within that palace compound, access to the main palace building was extremely restricted, even to palace staff. And that was made apparent to me throughout my research, because people would often tell me a story about Oh, the first time that I managed to sneak a glimpse into the throne room was when, you know, my uncle kind of stuck me into the building out of hours or whatever it, whatever it might be. So you have this separation of space and um, that's really important and that continues. The palace was then institutionalised within the formation and, um, of the monarchy in the 1960s when you get the construction of the building, which is the main building that visitors now visit as a museum. And, um, and in my thesis, I argue and, um, that the monarch at the time, so that was Mahendra Shah, he was able to bring the kind of palace into service, if you like, of the monarchy as a symbol of, a symbol of office. And um, so it wasn't seen, and, um, and um, to many people, the idea was that it wouldn't be seen to many, many people as a luxurious um, royal home. And um, so you have this separation of space, you have the palace understood, therefore, as something and, um, that is part of the monarchy that is there to serve the people. So you have it as a symbol of office. And, um, and, um, but then you have the questions and, um, that people were asking. And, um, and um, so there's quite a lot of poetry. And um, even though you can't pick up on explicit criticism of the monarchy from the time, you can pick up and um, that there and, um, was an understanding of where power lay and, um, and real suspicions of corruption and, um, that lay within that power. And all of that was localised on the space and, um, of the Marianhiti Palace. So when and, um, the Panchayat system came to an end in 1990, and, um, King Birendra actually opened the palace and, um, to the public for the first time. So the palace becoming a museum and, um, in... 2008 isn't the first time and um, that the palace opens to the public and um, so Berendra understood and, um, and um, the need and um, to create a shared memory of a democratic monarch so people were able to walk up the main steps of the building but they followed a different route to the route that people follow now they followed the king's official route through the building and um, so reinforcing and um, the role of the monarch then he also and, um, put a collection of his father, and um, so the person who was king in 1951, and um, who took back over from the Ranas, and could be argued to be seen by some, to be seen therefore as kind of a father of the nation or father of democracy. So he brings in a collection of items relating to a trip with them, and um, so people see those, and um, literally just after they've seen the throne room as they walk through. So by opening up the palace to the public, he was presenting the palace as common to all. In 2008, you then have the Constituent Assembly, and um, who at the same moment that they declare Nepal to be no longer a monarchy, they declare, declare the palace to be a museum. And, um, and um, so this link and, um, between power and this site and, um, is 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 actually a continuity but one of the th it was very obvious and um to all of the visitors that I spent time with and um at the palace and um that it was no longer a museum and then um, they are able to pass through the gates and um on every day of the week apart from Wednesdays they are able to pay a fee and go into the spaces of the palace and um but there are a number of interesting continuities as well so the army is still based on the Narangiti palace site at the time it opened and um it wasn't just the queen mother and um and um but Ganendra's stepmother and um was also living on the site the staff and um who were um running the palace and um were then also running the museum and there's also that kind of relationship between seeing queues of people outside of those walls that i described and um, who would have previously been queuing up perhaps to receive tikka on the occasion and, um, of Dosai, and, um, or perhaps showing up to show their respects after the massacre in 2001, who were then queuing up and, um, to visit the museum. So there are some differences. Nominally, this is a site that is open and that belongs to the public, but there are also a number of continuities as well. 
it's quite interesting to learn that the the physical space as well as the collection in the museum as it stands now was in the in the making for a long time before it actually became the museum this museum you have mentioned elsewhere that this has been fabricated as a way to remember or memorialize the institution of monarchy why is this important who brings together or fabricates this museum how was the palace curated do you see anything has been uh, erased in this process of curation so in the in the period between um, 2008 and February 2009, which is actually when the public were able to step through the gates and the doors for the first time, you have a whole series of activities that took place. And um, so some of these took place very publicly and some of them and, um, were much more behind the scenes. So publicly what you saw, and um, particularly in the first few months of that period and um, after May 2008 and that first meeting of the Constituent Assembly, you see playing out in the media conversations about what property and um, was owned by the state, what property was owned by the Shah family as a family, and therefore and um, what should be where. And um, so the king and um, at the time and um, Ganendra Shah and his wife Kamal. They were given um, two weeks or 15 days to leave the palace and um, after May 2008. And, um, and there were lots and lots of newspaper articles speculating on people seeing um, trucks and um, coming and going from palace gates, carrying and, um, boxes and boxes of documents and, um, and piles of furniture, etc. And um, so this was a topic that was of, an, um, of great importance to people and the idea that this would be that the content of the palace would be laid bare and made available to people was seen and, um, by the politicians as being kind of a unifying narrative, if you like. You then have um, a group of experts who are brought in and, um, to help with this process. So these are people who were working and, um, as curators for other and, um, national museums run by the Department of Archaeology and people working and, um, for the Ministry of Culture, but who had training and, um, in museum studies. These people and, um, supported and, um, the palace staff in creating an inventory and um, of everything that was on site. Now this was very very different and, um, to the process of collections documentation that you might go through and um, if you were running a museum and it was much more tied with that kind of what is here and who owns it and, um, and um, that I just mentioned before. They and, um, became under some political pressure and, um, to then open the site quite quickly. And um, so this process started in the autumn and, um, and they worked and, um, with the staff who had run the palace in order to gain an understanding of what the different activities were that took place and, um, in different rooms. And then my understanding is that there was some pressure to, within quite a short space of time and um, to get the palace open. And um, so it wasn't necessarily the interpretation that we see now, which is basically one label per room and um, giving the official function of the room that wasn't necessarily always intended to be the permanent narrative. And, um, and um, but that's that's what we have in place. So it's in, in many ways, it's a lack of. It is curated, of course, and um, and but I would say it was consciously cu curated more by the ex staff who worked for the palace who were um saying okay this was in this room this was in this room this is what happened in this room and um and then by the museum professionals themselves mm, th that's fascinating so this is much more about memory of the part former palace staff than it is about the curation of a museum in the technical sense so i mean if we think about this, this is really interesting. So um, how did the the people who then were in charge, the former palace staff, how did they interpret this? How did they make sense of their own job that was suddenly something completely different? So they went through a period of extreme insecurity during those few months. And then between May 2008 and February 2009, there were 
over 700 people working for a large institution that was even and um, during the democratic period and particularly in latter years under Ganendra and um, was at the center of power and um, of the country. And um, so that one, the first thing that became very obvious was they really felt that they had lost their status. And um, they felt very insecure about what their future would be, because during that period, they had been um, placed into a special department of the, um, the Department of General Administration within the civil service. But they weren't um, in a position and, um, to apply for any position in the civil service that they would like because they hadn't taken any civil service exams and then um, they'd come into their roles within the palace and then um, for a range and um, through a range of different routes and many of those of course would be and um, through their families and um, that bond of trust between particular families and the royal family and um, was very strong and um, so the sense of insecurity and um, was something for them they also felt felt very strongly and um, that the experts and museum experts that were being brought in to help to open up and um, the palace building and um, to the public during that period they felt that they just didn't understand what the what true operation of the palace was they felt that there was um uh, kind of that they were being pushed and um to kind of just show and um the highlights and the kind of the rooms that were on display in the main palace building that related to some of the official events that took place, but not necessarily life within within the palace staff as they knew it. So from the moment of the palace opening, they were taking actions both individually and collectively, and then um, to ensure that their voices were heard. And I they they saw some of them at least saw their role as one of sacrifice and um so if the monarch had had to step back and um from his role in order to enable the country to be um secure and to have a unified future then the least that they could do would be and um to act as caretakers if you like and um and um, for this site of the monarchy and at the beginning and um it wasn't clear at all that the monarchy in their minds that the monarchy wouldn't return of course that changed and um over a period of time so every year when it was Ganendra's birthday a number and um of the staff I was working with would always go and receive tikka and um from him at his house and um when um a member of staff left everybody would come together and the events that they were recounting wouldn't be events from the last few years and um of the institution being open as a museum they would be telling stories and um of that person's career as they had worked for the palace and um household there were groups particularly of women and um within the museum staff and um who would maintain certain rituals and um at different sites and um in the ground for example and a couple of people because of their particular professional skills whether that be driving or photography would actually still take contract work and um for the ex-king and um so they many people still saw themselves as connected to the ex-royal family but equally for some perhaps more junior members and, um, of the ex-palace staff, this was a moment of freedom for them. And um, they, some people were given the option to join Ganendra and Kamal and to go and work for them as a family. And um, many people, and, um, of course, were not out of a staff of 700. And, um, and the staff and, um, who were left behind and um, then, of course, had a different future and um, ahead of them with the civil service. So for some, they felt that they were and, um, there and um, to preserve the heritage of the monarchy as they understood it. And for some, it was a new beginning. That's interesting. And how does that then compare to the museum professionals that you have just mentioned? So who were they? So the museum professionals are largely people and um, who have taken civil service exams and um, who have 
and um, been fortunate to receive a um, up to master's level and um, at least an um, education. Many people had received their um, actually um, degrees in museum studies from universities in India, for example, and, um, and were applying those understandings of a modern museum institution to their understanding of the Marinhiti and um, Palace Museum. So for those staff, and, um, they would often talk to me about how the Marinhiti Palace was not a museum. And um, so they would talk about how the intention was for it had been, sorry, for it to become a museum, but the fact that there wasn't collections work and um taking place, the fact that there wasn't documentation work taking place, some of these kind of key activities, and I suspect also the fact that they were no longer managing the site and um meant that they took a very critical view. And um the management of the site has since changed hands from the ex-palace staff and um, to those experts. So when I have the opportunity to go back, I'm very much looking forward and um, to seeing if there's a difference and seeing if perhaps there's a programme of temporary exhibitions or something that you might um, associate with traditional museum practice. But the ex-palace staff um, um, had a lot of autonomy and um, so they were running the site and, um, on a day-to-day -day basis and they would be able to make very small changes that many visitors wouldn't even notice and um, either because they were only visiting once in a lifetime and um and um or just perhaps because they were very subtle changes so things i noticed were and um i th think i talked about this when i gave the talk was about a television and um and this television and um it wasn't there in 2010 it wasn't there in 2012 and then suddenly in 2013 this massive toshiba i even remember the the brand and um television appeared and um in what was described as the room that the king and queen would use as their waiting room before they took part in big official ceremonies in the main reception hall and um and the reason given for this and um by the staff i was talking to is that they had so many questions from visitors and um about the life of the ex king and um particularly berendra and um and the life of the ex queen that they felt that they needed to insert something just to demonstrate that these to have something that people could focus on and um and for people to be able to understand that Birendra and his wife Ashwarya were normal people. They also watched television and then when they were relaxing between official events. That's a very small thing and um and that and it go but it goes right up to the scale of developing master plans and um to incorporate other buildings on the site in the visitors route in order that visitors understood the palace as a as an operational administrative centre that involved a number of different functions rather than just a ceremonial building that was initially opened in 2008 thank you this is this is so fascinating and it also provides a, a very um, interesting perspective on heritage studies and you you have uh, talked about this desire to preserve and protect the palace as a fundamental tenet of heritage practice. Could you explain why this preservation of the palace is fundamental to the way in which uh, new Nepal represents itself and the Nepali history is taught uh, in, in different ways? So the latter part of that question is really interesting, and I'm not sure that I can answer it at this point, but it makes me think that I really need to go away and do some more research and find out. So that's about how Nepali history is taught. But I can talk a bit about um, why the preservation of the palace is fundamental to the way the new Nepal, Nepal represents itself. So following, if, if we go right back to 2001, following the death of Birendra, the Maoist leaders at the time took the opportunity to recast him and um, as aligned with their cause, representative of the patriotic people who would now suffer from his loss. In contrast, Ganendra, the new king, and um, became the subject and, um, of criticism, and um, to put it mildly. So rather than railing against the feudal feudalism of the monarchy, what they did was to adopt the memory of the dead king to their cause by suggesting that he had this undeclared kind of working unity alongside them, declaring that they had similar views on a range of national issues. 
and then present Ganendra and um, the um, brother of Birendra who took over and um, after Birendra's death in 2001 to present him and um, as the person and um, to be fighting against and um, representative of the institution so that's so the narrative starts and um, with the Maoists right back in 2001 and this narrative and um, has continued and is presented um there's a presentation I guess of a series of struggles for democracy and um and we'll talk in a minute um about the memorial that is also built and um and I'm on the palace site but in the palace building itself the focus is very much on the ceremonial role of the king and you could argue that because Ganendra was alive he's the only Shah king who's ever, ever been able to make any decisions and um about what were his personal belongings and what belonged to the state and um and so of course he will have taken some items with him but there is no interpretation at the site at all and um official interpretation of the site that relates to Ganendra and um the official interpretation of the site and um reflects and um the annual cycle of ceremonial activities and events and um and casts Birendra in that role and um whether it's reference to him working in his office whether it's and um his robes and um on display in the throne room and um and it's only the palace staff that I mentioned before that start to disrupt this narrative and they do things like and um they bring the chair in which Ganendra was sitting and um at the point that he declared that he would be leaving the palace and um and um they bring that in the in the press conference they bring that chair back to where it was during that press conference and disrupt and um the presentation of that main reception hall and um as um a place and um simply where the king and queen would be greeting foreign dignitaries foreign guests and maybe conferring and um, medals and um and positions of office to members of the civil service or members of the army and um so they had they had that power and um there but the relationship of the palace to national identity is very much linking the institution of the monarchy but a safe version of the monarchy that was focused on and um its ceremonial aspects and disconnecting or forgetting and um and um the history the more recent history the more violent history and um of the monarchy and its association with the people of Nepal so they were very active efforts to build and um connections with Birendra and um so another example that um I have talked about before is um is the bedroom and um that's on display in the palace and um so there is a bedroom on display in the palace and um in this bedroom and um if you ever have the opportunity to visit and um you may feel and um it's very small and um you may wonder about this being the bedroom and um of the monarchy and um so what you see and um is a double bed and um and um a very kind of heavy and um patterned carpet a very heavy kind of patterned cover and um over the bed and a few family photographs and um on the shelves and um above the bed also and um a painting and um which is um supposed to have been painted by by Aishwarya and um the wife and um and um of the then king Barendra. And what happens when people are visiting that room is they ask um, um, questions um, um, about, was this really where the king and queen um, um, slept? And the gallery attendants, um, um, who at the time of my research were ex-palace staff, would talk, use the opportunity to talk about, and um, yes, they only had this amount of wardrobe space. They were very simple people. And um, and and um, projecting and um, um this kind of intimate encounter and um with Birendra and his wife. But Birendra and his wife and um or and Ganendra and Kamal and also Birendra's father before him, Mahendra and his wife, none of those monarchs slept in that room in that palace. And um so that was created and um they slept in other buildings on the site. So um Mahendra and um, was in Mahendra Manjul, where the Queen Mother still lives, and um, Birendra was in Sri Sadan, which is now open and um, to the public. So this room was entirely and um, constructed 
to create nostalgia and um, of the dead king. And uh, but it is a really interesting question to ask about how this particular representation of the monarchy relates to how Nepali history is taught. So I think that's worthy of further research. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, you know, in the sense of having this family history, which is narrated now in the palace, but the palace now is standing for something which is much bigger. So how are the are different aspects of Nepalese history um, brought together in this material space of the museum? And especially how are those connections between the Narayan Hitti Palace and the Ganatantra Smarak um, presented here? And um, so the Ganatantra Smarak and, um, is a memorial that is constructed now and open to the public and, um, and um, on the east side of the Narayanhiti site. And um, it's a, a memorial to the Republic. So the new Nepal was to be represented by the Ganatantra Smarak and um, in order to substitute one national narrative for the other. And um, so in the absence of any uniform or unified version and, um, of Nepal's recent past, you can see the coordinates of a national Nepali national identity being set and, um, at the Ganatantra Smarak. So the narrative of martyrdom, and, um, for example, and, um, and, the, and the martyrdom of all victims of the conflict as being equal. The narration of the People's War as the natural culmination of a long history of popular and um, democratic struggle. And um, so you see photographs and um, in the exhibition there, and um, for example, of people outside the main gates of the palace in 1990 and um, during the Jamandalan and um, on kind of on the Mahendra stand, statue there. So this is all indicating that the desire to summarize identity and memory at the site is got. It doesn't have anything to do with confronting difficult histories, but it's a lot about legitimizing the new government and individual political parties. And um, so lots of this was led by the office of the prime minister at the time that the Maoist party and, um, was leading government. And the attempt is to restore, what I argue was in my thesis, the attempt was to restore faith in the unity of the collective through focusing on the transfer of power, because it avoids those awkward questions about who did who, who did what to who. Um, and the intention and, um, was that visitors would visit the main Narayanhiti Palace, and um, they would buy their ticket, they would enter, and then they would move through the site and then be able to end their visit and then um, through a visit to the Republic Memorial. And then um, so there is a direct, direct connection with this idea of we are, we are who we are because of what we are not anymore and then um, and, um, what we have left behind. And, um, and we have together and um, come together in and, um, the face of adversity against this autocratic monarchy and, um, and um, to move forward. And um, so that's the narrative and, um, that I picked up through both the design of the memorial and, um, and also the narrative and, um, through the route through the palace. Uh, Narayanti Palace is also a place where royal massacre in 2001 took place. Um, and the massacre took place at the site called um, uh, Trivuan Southern. And now this, this building, Trivuan Southern, uh, it was fairly, very quickly after the massacre, it was de demolished. And now the building is being reconstructed. What do you think about this reconstruction that's going on? And what do you think about the reinterpretation of the site and memorialization of that particular event? So you have a history that's presented at the Palace Museum that is dependent on the site being really real, i.e. it really was the Royal Palace, in order to be able to represent this reconstructed monarchical past as it really was. And, um, and that included providing access to the site of the Royal Massacre. And um, so I went back and I looked at and, um, many of the speeches that were given by politicians and um, at the time of the announcement of the palace becoming opened as a museum. And in fact, on the day and, um, of the inauguration of the site. And there was a direct connection between we're opening up this site to the public, and that includes providing answers and, um, to what happened 
happened and um, in June 2001. So I argue in my thesis that the national identity narratives being channeled through the creation of a shared memory at the Palace Museum originate in those narratives of disbelief that were created in response to the political situation that followed the Royal Massacre in 2001. And, um, and um, so you have the the destruction of the site and um, took place earlier. And um, I don't know exactly when, but it took place while the monarchy was still and, um, and, um, around. Um, whether that was, some people say that was under the um, authority of the then king. Some people say that was under the authority of the then queen mother. And um, either way, it was a decision in the first couple of years and uh, maybe even first couple of months and, um, after the massacre happened in 2001. But then... In those last couple of weeks and um, that I mentioned before, and um, in early 2009, before the palace is opened up to the public, you see photographs and um, of the foundations of that building, Tribune and Saddam, and um, being reconstructed. And uh, then when you visit the site, and um, the initially you would have had a tour and um, an ex-member of palace staff touring you around the building, and they were expected to end the tour and um with taking visitors through Tripura and Sudden. And um and but they found that they were being asked so many different questions and um and that made them feel very uncomfortable. They actually started to end the tour early. So they started to end the tour and um at the edge of the building and um after the room in the basement and um where the king and um would have given them Tika and um on the occasion and um of Dossai. And people were therefore allowed and, um, to look around that space for themselves. Now, that's quite interesting because just as the ex-Royal Palace staff were able to kind of perhaps disrupt this and, um, predominant historical narrative, making decisions for people to be able to explore a set base for themselves, also allows that potential and um, for disruption. So there are lots of questions and um, about exactly you know, exactly who killed who, exactly what happened where, and um, the signage and um, doesn't refer to any individual people, but it would say here is the spot and um, the, a bullet and um, killed Prince and uh, Nirajan, or here is the spot where Princess Shruti's and um, body was found and um, for example, and um, so there's this apparent transparency by it being the real place where things really happened. And um, but of course it's not that transparent. And what the and the, the signs that are marked up are exactly and um, related and um to the narration of events that were produced in an official report, and um in two thousand and one, not long after the massacre took place, and um so this tended to raise a whole lot more questions in people's mind about are you really showing us what was real and um and so the more questions came the more people who were heading up the service found it in their interest to say, we're the people that are providing you the answers. And um, so providing the foundation, so providing a tour didn't provide the answers. There were still doubts, there were still questions. Putting the foundations in place and um, didn't provide the answers, there were still questions. And um, so then what you start to see and um, is people not proposing to reinvestigate the incident, and um, but to recreate and um, the incident. So you actually start to see the reconstruction of the buildings that were, or the refabrication of the buildings that were deconstructed, and um, back in two thousand and one, and that's where we are now. So visitors and um, to the Narin Hitti Palace now, they leave the main palace building, and then um, they come out of the west entrance on the ground floor, and they can literally walk into and um triple and seven and um but they they whereas in the main palace building you can enter rooms the the rooms are still presented as still lives if you like because you're and um there are barriers in place you can't touch any of the objects there is a distance between you and the, and the objects in the space that are presented there for you in, that distance is even kind of even further if you like and um with triple and seven because each of these rooms 
and um, is glazed. I couldn't tell you if it's actually glass or if it's plastic, and, um, and, um, but it's glazed. And the idea is that you look through and um, the sign that you're reading is of the same style as the sign in the main palace building. And um, so it would, for example, say, this is the billiard room. This is the room and, um, where the family would meet on Fridays and um, to socialize before and after dinner. And, um, and this is where the bodies of these members of the ex royal family were were found and um so visitors progressively find themselves and um able to kind of experience and um this their own personal investigation and um of the events and um of that night and one of the things that is really striking is the reconstruction and um, of this site began of course, the decision to fund it was taken earlier, but the reconstruction began in 2014 and continued and, um, during the time and um, that Nepal was needing to find an awful lot of money to reconstruct and, um, and parts of the country after the earthquakes in 2015. And um, so it's, it's also interesting to me that this... It's clear that many people visit the palace in order to under, in order to access the site where the royal family died. And um, but if you were to look at the website as it was during the time of my research and the website as it's presented now, there is no mention and um of this part of the museum's displays. And um and yet this is the part of the museum's displays that has have received the most funding, as far as I can understand. the most funding and perhaps also the most visitors in a way as there seems to be an awful lot of an interest in in the um, royal massacre and a lot of disbelief too so i that's really fascinating that you have con completely invented refabricated um, buildings standing there which takes you through memory in in a way so you also talk about Naranhiti as a memory palace, um, which obviously is very fabricated here. Now, referring to the idea of the ancient Greek memory aid that allows you to visualize memories, hence the memory palace, by locating these as a mind map. Um, hmm. Now, how does that work for the Naranhiti palace if this is completely fabricated? So I really I love this question. It's a great question. And um, so firstly, museums confuse and mix up time and um, and all visitors to any museum and um, let alone the Palace Museum are linking their present day experience to the past. And there is and one of the things that I uncover and um, through my research, there is a contrast between the official attempts to present a fixed idyllic view of Nepal's past and Nepal's monarchy and the fact that you have thousands and thousands of individual, all carrying, individuals all carrying out their own performance through their visit to the Palace Museum and each of those individuals being affected by the historical experiences that have transmitted across the generations of their family and their friends. So this memory palace and um, that I'm referring to isn't necessarily referring to the official and um, narrative that is on display. What I'm referring to is the palaces, the spatial understanding of place and time, and um, that enables every visitor and um, to that palace and um, to recall and um, recent and some non-recent historical events. So. All of the people that I spent time with during my research had all lived through at least one democracy movement and um, they'd lived through an, um, turmoil, they'd lived through a state being made, unmade and then made again and all of that had been the backdrop to their lives and um, so I found it quite interesting to explore and um, if you think about history intensifying in a time of change, what does that mean in the context of a society where the production of history was actively censored until 1990? And um, it means it's not trusted. And um, so I, I, of course, have my own understanding of Nepal, but the only way that I could experience this memory palace was through the visitations of other people. And um, some people, and um, particularly and, um, artists and authors, actually wrote, chose 
in the year after the palace opened as a museum, they chose to write about their experience of visiting the palace. And um, Manjushri Tapper is one of those people. And she articulated the impact of her experience of change on her understanding of Nepal's past. And um, by talking about the truth having been lost many, many times and that that truth could be lost again. And this account that was written in response to the confusion that many people felt after the massacre suggests to me that there are Nepalis for whom every experience of political change serves, serves to kind of further reveal a lack of a history that they can rely on. And that perhaps explains and then why you have this very static presentation at the Palace Museum. And um, so it's theorized like this, the palace is um, constituted as a storehouse of memories that are always haunted with a myriad of possibilities. And um, and I, ask, I guess I go back to that point that I made at the beginning about considering things like the visitor's act of queuing. And um, so the museum is open to the public all year round, five days a week, and um, queues start um, to form at the southern gate of the palace from about half past nine in the morning. The museum doesn't open till about 11. And, um, um, and that daily spectacle is entirely reminiscent of the long queues that would form during its life as a royal palace and um, during particular days and then um, when it was open. And um, so individual people are making sense of the displays in their own way. What that means as events become more distant I think is 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 particularly interesting but it's in those it's in that sense and um, that I was referring to the palace as a memory palace as you mentioned uh, you know different people have experienced uh, the institution of monarchy in different ways and all these experiences have not necessarily been very positive. Um, how inclusive do you think is Narahiti Palace as a museum? And how is the museum dealing with uncomfortable histories or relationships between the palace and the people? It isn't. And um, the, the, the palace and um, this historical narrative and, um, that we've been discussing says it's for everybody and um, by throwing open the doors and, um, to the palace. And, um, and it's a um, narrative that hinges on an illusion that there is a consensus that has been reached over the nature of the transition and that the trauma of the conflict and um, recent conflict is very much in the past. So this and, um, plays and, um, on people's experience of the monarchy and, um, and the Palace Museum isn't explicit about creating an, um, a historical narrative. The, the response to that and um, by people who visit and um, can be well either people don't visit because they don't see anything there and um, for them and um, or the response can be is that it and um, perhaps because they were expecting the palace to be dripping with gold or perhaps because they're left to interpret what happened on that night in June 2001. And this absence that was experienced by visitors encouraged them to fill the space and um, with their own imagination and um, so in my experience most visitors to the palace museum don't spend any time investigating or inspecting the objects in each room what they're doing is trying to remember palace life and um, as it was um, last as it was represented and um, so they're thinking about and um, Berendra and um, in a particular room and um, or they're thinking and um, kind of about how the family interacted and um, within the space. So they're, what they're doing, therefore, is forgetting. Everybody is collectively forgetting and forgetting, just like remembering, can be public as well as private. So while you have memory triggered by collective symbols, um, forgetting operates producing these absences or these substitutes. And, um, and absences which are discouraging and um, the construction and the survival and, um, of memory and um, or redirecting memory and um, across alternative routes. So it's a subtle process and um, not least because we we tend to forget what it is that we've forgotten. And that's arguably when it's most successful. And that, I think, is what's quite interesting about the point 
about the point that we have reached now and um, is I think that these absences are becoming a lot more obvious and um, to a much wider range of people and it will be very it, after the talk and um, as part of this program and um, that I gave the other day it's very clear that this erasure is very actively felt and um, by some people so my answer here is um, particularly inadequate because there are more communities including indigenous communities who are turning to the format of museum in order to create a platform for their own voices and um but the website of the Narian Hiti Palace Museum is making clear that it's about marking the moment of the transition and it is still riding and um on the fact that there um, will be some kind of unity alongside that and in that sense it's not unlike other royal palaces that have become museums so the Forbidden City in Beijing for example or the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul which was also converted into a museum just two years after um, the change and, um, in political system. But those sites are, act, are very obviously actively interpreted for visitors. And so visitors at least understand that they're entering a social institution. And that's the difference with the Narian Hiti Palace Museum, where people don't appear to understand that they're acting, they're entering a social institution. They therefore don't understand and, um, that they are complicit in this act of forgetting. And that's where it becomes um, um, dangerous over a period of time. That is totally fascinating and thank you so much for this um, long explanation and do you actually see now that the museum is opening a new dialogue for a future Nepal? I guess when I began my research and um, the the new history of Nepal's old Shah monarchy seemed triumphant and um, so after all you have the palace opened as a museum you have it visited by thousands of Nepali visitors every month something that still continues 15 years later and um, and you have articles in the print media that were showing that this visiting together had become a shared memory it's very clearly about kind of what we are no, no longer drawing on that mor moral authority of them um, the institution of a museum. At the beginning, I even had questions about whether and um, there was a future possible, whether it was seen as a site and um, for the future possible return and um, of the monarchy. That's not something and um, that I think and um, anymore. And um, but this empty space, this ambivalent space, and um, and um, that we see and um, provides space for reflection. And you have people like the ex-palace staff who, over the period of time that they were running the site, were able to kind of disrupt the official narrative. You have the gradual kind of degradation of the buildings on the site, which is very apparent from outside. And um, so the palace hasn't been fully consigned to the past, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And um, political instability, repeated changes of personnel, finite resources, earthquakes, um, influence of the army who still have regiments on the site. And um, um, all of these play into um, um, the kind of the political decision just to keep the palace as it is, because anything else will require discussion and decision making and, um, and therefore has political potency and the potential to raise more questions than it answers. Thank you so much, Brian Woodmarsh. That was fantastic. And I'm sure um, anyone who listened to this um, will make sure that they will go to the palace soon to see everything and make up their mind. Please do. Thank you so much, Brian. We really appreciate your time. Likewise, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Commissioned music for this podcast has been produced by Vayu Audio Studios. Composer, music arrangement, guitar, tuna, sound mix and master, Vayu. Madai Dime Damaha and percussion, Kunal Singh. Bamboo flute, Anish Mahajan. Recorder, Jaco. Bass guitar, BK. Cello, Celso.